all this is dr mubin sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show so the discussion today is without much drawings i am actually interested in the study that i'm going to share with you plus i'm also confused for the purpose of the study so let's look at the study together and this is drbean.com I was supposed to change the uh, price on this Monday, but there is a family member in my home who's sick, so I'm not getting a chance to do it. There are links in the description of this video where you can either become a member of Dr. Bean or uh, use those to support this work. So having said that, let's look at some of the things. This is the study. It is 23rd June 2023, incidence of myopericarditis after messenger RNA COVID-19 vaccination, a meta-analysis with focus on adolescent age 12 to 17 years. So it's a, it's a good study in terms of the purpose of it. And that is, hey, let's look at the myopericarditis incidence in this age group, because this is the age group that after the messenger RNA vaccines is seen to be most affected with cardiac issues. So Let's look at the results first, and then I'll, I'll share some of my reservations about this study. So the results are, and if any of uh, the folks are thinking that, hey, did they look at Israeli study or others? Yes, they are all included here. So let's go to those diagrams. So here, if you see, these are the studies that are for the BioNTech and Moderna vaccines. And if you see here, this is the BioNTech and Moderna. These are the 14 studies they included and their meta-analysis is that the 43.5 cases of myocarditis per million doses of the vaccine. And you can actually see here, for example, the Israeli studies or those, they, they are in hundreds. And then there are studies for example, here, SU CDC, which are really uh, smaller amounts of uh, myopericarditis. So this is one forest plot they have. Then this was another. This is the Pfizer alone. And once again, if you look at Pfizer, it is 41.8 per million doses of the vaccine. So if I ask you a question up to here, that what is your takeaway, I think that you would say that yes, at least, so you like the study or you do not like the study, you like the vaccines or you do not like the vaccines, that is all a different discussion. I'm looking at the study as a, as an analysis done. And so here is where we have reached so far in this analysis that 41.8 per million doses or 43.5 cases of myopericarditis per million doses is what they found after doing the meta-analysis. Now, here are some interesting things about this study. First one, the authors know it, and we all know it, that majority of this, uh, or a higher percentage, of myocarditis cases occur in boys in this age group. However, when you look at this analysis, they do have a, an age-based cohort risk ratio analysis, but not the forest plot for that. So that is the first thing that was surprising for me. Why? Because I was actually in interested in that. I was not trying to poke holes in this study. I was trying to understand that, all right, how did it look for boys of this age? So if you see here, if you look at their results, they said 15 studies were included. The pooled incidence of myopericarditis after mRNA vaccines among adolescents aged 12 to 17 years were 43.5 cases per million vaccine doses for both of the vaccines or 41.8 for one of them. 
and then they say myopericarditis was more common among male than females. And you can see here 66.0 cases versus 10.1 cases. So males was a primary cohort. So mixing both of those data points to kind of compare to others in my opinion, isn't the best way to handle it, but th th this is what they did. I am not impressed with this strategy. Second, for me, that was interesting is, so I was thinking what they're gonna do is the following, they, they would pick up this number and then they would say, hey, the, my, the COVID infection has the following myocarditis rate. So compared to infection, this is what happens but that's not what they did. I also thought that maybe they would pick up this rate and compare it to the background rate for 12 to 17 years old to say normally 12 to 17 years old develop myocarditis incidences at this rate. Let's call it background rate. And then they'll say, well, with the vaccine, the risk increases by, by this percent or this times, whatever it is. But they didn't do that. That was interesting for me. They did not do that. They did not compare this number to the background rate or they did not compare it to the infection. So that, then the curiosity became, what did they compare it to? Because if you read this statement here, none of the incidences of myopericarditis carditis pooled in the current study were higher than those after smallpox vaccination and non-COVID-19 vaccinations, and all of them were significantly lower than those in adolescents aged 12 to 17 years after COVID-19 infection. So this statement is here, that after COVID-19 infection, but the comparison is with the smallpox. So there is another study where the myocarditis was observed. That's also a pooled study. That's also a meta-analysis where smallpox and other vaccines like flu vaccine and others are pooled together to look at the myopericarditis. This is compared to that. So that means if we just sit down as doctors for a second, what they're telling us is, Hey guys, we did the analysis for messenger RNA based vaccines and we compared them to smallpox vaccine. And we feel that this is the, there is no difference. There's not much difference. They do add the COVID-19 infection over here, but I want to show you something. So here they say, the background incidence of myopericarditis in adolescents aged 12 to 17 years is unknown. So think about it for a second. Why is it unknown? I actually went through these thoughts and maybe I'm just uh, silly that I don't catch these advanced scientific <laughs> messages. So they are saying that the background rate is unknown for this group. Why is it unknown? It may be unknown because there isn't much myopericarditis in this group. That's why it is unknown. If there was a common occurrence of these myopericarditises, then maybe that data would have been more available and more looked at. Anyways, so they say, well, we do not know the background rate. So what we did was we were unable to compare the data pooled in the present study with it, that background rate, because that is missing. Myopericarditis was first found to be associated with smallpox vaccine. This is a very interesting statement for me. Myopericarditis was first found to be associated with smallpox vaccine. So the vaccine for the first time, if I can understand this sentence, the vaccine was, smallpox vaccine introduced us to the concept of myopericarditis after a vaccine. 
So they say because that is the reason, because that is a fact, for example, then it is interesting to compare it to smallpox. What kind of a logic is that? So they say, thus, a comparison with the smallpox vaccine is appropriate. That is really a strange logic for a scientist to make or a bunch of scientists to say that, hey, you know what? The first time we, this cohort, 12 to 17, we actually don't find background rates for myocarditis in it. So we don't have much to compare with. So how about we compare it with something else? And now what is the something else? Smallpox had myocarditis. Let's compare it to that. Smallpox vaccine. Smallpox vaccines are of different type, different technology, uh, different, uh, they're stopped in since 1970s. Comparing, plus smallpox vaccines actually have one of the highest rates of myocarditis. Comparing to them is to compare to maximum myocarditis incidence causing vaccine. And if it compares equally with it, then to simply say, you know what, no difference. We found nothing. So if smallpox myocarditis is acceptable, then this myocarditis cases should be acceptable too. Nothing to see here. That was interesting for me to go out and do this comparison. Because if you're going to compare it, then smallpox is not really used here unless there is, an, uh, there is a high exposure uh, chance. So if you see here from uh, CDC, CDC says routine vaccination against smallpox in the United States ended in the 1970s. However, for specific population at high risk of occupational exposure to orthopox viruses, the 2015 Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices recommends routine vaccination against the disease. And then they talk about the vaccines. So since 1970, that vaccine is not given. And the researcher said, you know what? We should compare it to that vaccine. A more common vaccine, for example, flu vaccine. But <laughs> the interesting thing is the flu vaccine incidence of myocarditis is very low. So check this out here. A meta-analysis published in 2022 pooled the incidence of myocarditis after smallpox vaccination, 132.1 cases per million vaccines. Now keep remembering that this actually said the background incidence of myocarditis in this age group is not known. So I kind of, I look at it as a physician to say, okay, so what they're saying is we, the, re, the incidence isn't high enough to have been reported and monitored and, and um, presented. Not that there is an incidence and we just are so blind to it, there is a whatever. So that is the situation. And here they are looking at a vaccine that has 132.1 cases per million vaccine doses. A non-COVID-19 vaccination, including smallpox, influenza, and various other 56.0 cases per million. These pooled incidences are not related to the COVID-19 epidemic and would not be affected by the large number of new studies. Strange, uh, if they said, we are comparing vaccines and their myocarditis, fine. That is a good, interesting academic study to do. Check this out. This meta-analysis also summarized the incidence of myopericarditis after influenza vaccine, and that was 1.3 cases per million vaccine doses. 1.3 cases. So they didn't really compare it to the influenza. If they just wanted to compare it to other vaccines, they could have said, compare to influenza, 1.3, and here 49 or 48 or 41 or whatever. They went to the highest one, smallpox. And I still don't actually agree with 
that comparison, but that, that's what they did. Uh, at the end of the day, they, they did a study, they published it. That is the study. They compared it to a pool of smallpox and other vaccines. And they give reasons for why did they do it so that these reasons are over here. Then I had one more um, issue with this study. And that is that they do, they do make this statement, as I read here, none of the incidences of myopericarditis pooled in the current study were higher than those after smallpox vaccinations and non-COVID-19 vaccinations, and all of them were significantly lower than those in adolescents aged 12 to 17 years after COVID-19 infection. So this after COVID-19 infection was interesting. So I want to I wanna touch on that for a second. I just want to read one more statement from here. Conclusion, the incidence of myopericarditis after mRNA COVID-19 vaccinations among adolescents aged 12 to 17 were very rare. They were not higher than other important references. So they just simply call them other important references. These findings provide an important context for health policymakers and parents with vaccination hesitancy to weigh the risks and benefits of mRNA vaccination among adolescent aged 12 to 17. So I actually thought about it. I'm a parent as well. So I was thinking that, man, smallpox has never been given since 1970. So my child doesn't have that risk. I'm thinking about an American parent. And then you, you are making an analysis and a comparison to that vaccine because that has the highest myocarditis incidence levels and then saying, hey, nothing to see here. Just go ahead, do it. Why not compare it to the other vaccines that if you're going to compare it to other vaccines, compare it to flu or other vaccines that are used nowadays and then tell me what is the ratio. Of course, that ratio would be really different and they didn't want to take that kind of a number in front of all of us and put that here. They just simply. So I really am surprised that they did this. OK, so I then went out and people on Discord know <laughs> that I had been bugging them to say I needed a number. The number I wanted to understand was the following. Uh, and this is a number that we have been in this uh, during this pandemic have been struggling with from the very beginning. And that number is the following. We know there are some people who become asymptomatically infected. We do not know the exact numbers. Then we know there are people who become infected, they become symptomatic, but they never go to the hospitals or, or doctors to get them tested. We even know those who reach out to the doctors. I was one of them who reached out to the doctor and I said, I have this COVID um, like symptoms. I did this over the counter antibody test and um, it says yes. So can I come in and get tested? And he said, no, no need, just stay home. So that was my age 50 and more. Even then I was asked, just stay home. So how many of those are actually just staying home at this 12 to 17 years of age? And then how many are those that are in the hospital or had to end up at the doctor to say, I need, I am not feeling well and I need this testing done and management done? Why am I bringing that up? The infection comparison that they do here, infection of COVID-19 cases to myocarditis, these are those PCR positive tests or patients. So how many of the 12 to 17 years, this is a genuine question, trying to understand their numbers. This is a genuine question to say, all right, so how many 12 to 17 actually ended up in the clinic or a hospital out of all that got infected? Then out of those 12 to 17 that ended up in the hospital or in clinic 
and got themselves tested, then became severe enough to have myocarditis. How many of those had comorbidities? For example, in children of this age, obesity is the biggest uh, or the leading cause that lands after COVID-19, that lands patients to in the hospitals. So I started looking for that data. Um, here is data that um, Faraz and John were helping me with. So let's look at it together. So this is a study that the current study that I'm discussing, meta-analysis, they referred to this study to take the myocarditis after infection rate from. In this study, the definition of the case is positive RT-PCR case. Not everyone infected, but everyone tested positive in this age range. So let's see what kind of a number is that. So this, thank you very much for the folks on Discord for helping me with these. This is one of the study. This study is actually an older study. If you see here, February 8, 2022, this is the previous variants, which were a little more aggressive compared to where we are at today in Omicron time. But still, there is some data in here that is interesting. That data is this. Let's just look at males. And this is children. This is not 12 to 17. This is children. And in this data, what they're saying is mild cases. So these are all encounters. So if I go back here, all pediatric encounters. And the definition of encounter was the patient came to the clinic or the hospital and was tested for COVID-19 and was then positive. That is what is happening here. So mild cases, 69,451. Mild ED, they ended up in the emergency department, 9,229. Moderate, 4,318. Severe, 791. Now, if you, if you look at this number, total were 83,789 in this study. Do you think that everyone who is infected, who had COVID, is represented in this number, in this 83,789? No, not everyone. Because there are two groups of people that are still missing from it. And I had that <laughs> tiny diagram here. So let me explain what this diagram is. This diagram has the same numbers as are here. So for example, 69,451 and total number 83,789. So 83,789. So all patients of COVID, any age group, First, there is a group that is asymptomatic. And I put 50% over here. And you could say that, how did you come up with 50%? And I want to show you. So this is a, an article with some studies in it. This is also an older article. I believe with Omicron, these dynamics are even further shifted. However, there are a few studies here that say a 2021 study found that children and young adults have a low chance of developing fever or respiratory symptom with COVID-19, but people who don't have these symptoms can still pass the coronavirus to others. So they're talking about uh, transmission. Then if you see here in a 2021 research review, experts found that the prevalence of asymptomatic COVID-19 among people with a confirmed COVID-19 infection was 40.5%. This is still 40.5% of asymptomatic in tested positive. Those who were not even tested positive. So there are, there is this group that is just 
asymptomatic. They don't even know that I have it. Then there is another group that may have symptoms and never actually bother to go because the symptoms are not big enough or, or intense enough. Or like in my case, wanted to go and get tested and the doctor said, no, just stay at home. What is this group? I can definitely think that 50% at least for the asymptomatic. In this age group, 12 to 17, which is actually a healthier age group and able to handle this much better. This whole group, the cases and the encounters and the, the incidence rates are actually based on this group. And that I think is not the correct way to look at it. So at least there should be a limit of this, a limitation of the study at least this should be a comparison that should not be done with ease. And it should have a lot of concerns around this. So just not do this comparison. Because if we do rough math, so this is not a statistically accurate math. So let's say these groups are 83,789. Almost 100,000, right? So less, less than 100,000. Let's say we have this group in 12 to 17 is maybe 10% of all of those who became symptomatic. We're not talking asymptomatic. All of those who became symptomatic, the ones who ended up in the hospital or a clinic or were bothered enough or had enough of the symptoms to actually go to the doctor, let's say they were 10%. Remember when COVID started, the 20% was the number of people who would end up in the hospital. Out of those 20%, then there was 5 or 6% that would end up in the ICUs and then 4 to 5% that would die. In this age group, there are actually no deaths and I have the CDC data to show you that. Let me just very quickly show you that data as well. Hmm. Okay, so if you look at the, I think it is related to this one. So if you look at this for 12 to 17 years of age, you will see that they would say uh, hospitalizations, yes, but deaths, no. Okay, so back here, if for children 12 to 17, we said all symptomatic, out of all symptomatic or out of all infected, 10% are these. Then another 90% are symptomatic and not tested. So that makes it a total of 837,890. Then there is another 50% that are just asymptomatic. They didn't even know, they didn't even go. If that is the case, then it would be 1.675 million actual infections out of which 83 would become 83,789, that would become encounters, out of which 50.1 to 64.9 will be myocarditis. So that would be 1.67 million out of which 50. Then if you compare that to 100,000 of the vaccines and having, let's say, whatever number they have, then you'll have to extrapolate that number back towards the uh, 1 million doses. And I think I have that number here. Yep. So here, if you see 12 to 17 years of age, the incidence of myocarditis and uh, or pericarditis were 50.1 to 64.9 per 100,000 of infection. So this is again the encounters. So you extrapolate the encounters, then this number actually becomes smaller. And then 2.2 to 3.3 after the first vaccine, 22.0 to 35.9 after the second dose. So if it is 22 to 35.9 after the second dose per 100,000, then you take them to 1 million, this would become 220 to 350. 
while this one if you extrapolate to 1.56 million as i showed you then this number actually becomes smaller the point is these comparisons were not valid comparisons so once again forgetting about liking the vaccine or not liking the vaccine the problem i had with this data became that man you're showing me you're throwing numbers at me that do not make sense to me that are not comparable so it looks like you are giving me wrong information and then thinking i should just take it and then tell it to others if i'm a physician then talk to the parents and say this these kind of numbers the numbers are not correct the only thing that is interesting in this is the meta analysis itself showing the number of cases per million doses that's the only they did a meta analysis and if you talk about meta analysis then here is the bmj bmj has this live document where they keep adding studies to this document to keep doing the meta analysis for example this study that we are looking at has 14 studies for meta analysis this one on the bmj is 46 studies with 14 on incidence 7 on risk factors 11 on characteristics and short term course and 3 and this and so on so if we have to just look at the meta analysis we can actually see the meta analysis with bigger studies so if you put this in front of a physician either the physician is going to look at it and just take this without doing the remaining research and say all right so what you're saying is regardless of male female the total is 41.8 or 43.5 i would have once again if i was a slightly awake physician i would say you know what it is actually more common in boys men so maybe i needed a better clarity on this one compared to giving me this number so that's one the second thing will be for me to say or i right, tell me in context of covid infection what is the difference so the risk benefit analysis can be done and that analysis is just not the best analysis and again it is not this group this set of uh, researchers problem because they cited a different study to say we took analysis from this one so fine th that is this one from this study but the problem is this study is also talking about positive cases that are positive by testing positive what is that real number actually is uh, tested positive are they in this cohort 5% of everybody infected or 10% or 20 or 50 or 100% what is it so we we don't know and then thirdly comparing it to smallpox vaccine a vaccine that is never so a patient comes to me and i say you know what this has a similar um myocarditis incidence rate as smallpox and the patient is going to say but smallpox is never given and if you have further discussion with the parents to say well uh, parent says all right so smallpox is you're comparing it to that because it is really low it is really small so you think it's all good and you say no actually smallpox has the highest level of uh, incidence of myocarditis in fact the flu and others are lower <laughs> then what will the parent say why are you comparing it here then why are you not comparing it to those that are used and that have different numbers so for me it is it is a very it's an interesting study because it um feels like that they are going to answer a very important question and that is incidence of uh, the myocarditis compared to infection or other vaccines other vaccines is not very interesting for me especially smallpox but comparing it to flu will be very interesting that seems to be almost 25 times more in this one or more and comparing it to infection will be very interesting but then the infection numbers are not correct so this is the discussion 
sorry if I wasted your time, but I just could not understand. This, this is a good, the concept of the study is very interesting. But there are better uh, meta-analysis studies. There are better studies with the objectives or purposes than this one. And so this just did not make sense to me, but maybe that's just me. So with this, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, please like, subscribe, and share. In the description of this video, there are some links if you would like to support this work. Uh, you can become part of Substack. We actually discussed yesterday um, Dr. Peter Hortes and RFK Jr. and their positions. And we did a live, two live sessions and we discussed those. You can join those live sessions. We are actually going to do more of these talks because I was able to quickly discuss Dr. Hote's point of views and the flaws in there. However, for RFK Jr., there is a lot of volume of body of <laughs> work that he has done, books and articles and discussions and talks. So I was able to discuss a couple of concepts which he had gotten wrong. And um, once again, you have a doctor on one end, Peter Hotez, expert. And he has so many things that are just really weird. And then you have a non-doctor who says something. And so how do you compare them? Anyway, so that is the discussion we did yesterday. And uh, I promise that I would do some more discussion for RFK's positions about vaccines and how these uh, match with the mechanisms. And so these would be in the coming days. We do that on every Wednesday, one at 1 p.m. Pacific and the other session at 6 p.m. Pacific. So if you would like to be part of that, you can become a member of this YouTube channel or Substack or Patreon. And uh, we'll go from there. And uh, thank you very much for your listening in. And I would see you tomorrow. Bye for now. So Jean says, um, question, throughout your review of the study, who fund and influence the study? The study says no conflicts through one of the funds. Let's see. That's a good question, Jean. Thank you. Uh, let's see the... So declaration of competing interest, the author declared they have no known competing interest. Acknowledgement, this work was supported by the Scientific Research Fund of Xinjiang Medical University, grant number this. So this is a Chinese study or Chinese uh, supported studies or Xinjiang University supported study. This is a grant number. All data will be made available. It almost seems like we should ask them for the data and kind of do some more analysis that is going to be interesting instead of comparing it to smallpox. So um, a good question. Did I share my screen or not? <laughs> so if I did not share my screen, here is the uh, Declaration of Competing Interest. And here is acknowledgement. This work was supported by Scientific Research Fund of Xinjiang Medical University. So thank you very much uh, for your time, for listening in. And tell me, how do you see it? So let's say you are a physician or you are a nurse practitioner or nurse or, or healthcare uh, professional. How would you look at this study and what will be your narrative that would be influenced by this study? How would you look at things? I would really love to see it. Thank you and bye for now.